want to, I can move it around, uh, access constraint it, planar constraint it. Uh, I can go up here and uh, bring up a top and front view as well. Uh, usually I, I tend to work just in a single perspective view, but that's just me. Um, and as you might have seen there briefly, there are controls up here for, for actually adjusting what your camera view is. Uh, there's also tools for uh, setting and saving views, uh, recalling them. And then there is uh, sort of the, the view controls, so how things are presented to you, what the agents look like, uh, whether it's going to be shaded or wireframe view, um, and a bunch of other things in there as well. So we'll get to some of that in a bit. Um, as you might have noticed, you can right-click in a 3D view um, to create object. Um, you can also, in the Scene tab, or uh, just click on the kind of object that you want and it will place it in the scene. Typically what it will try and do, um, if you've got a, an object in the middle of the view as I do here, if I create a floor, it basically creates the floor at the same level as that object which is in the center of your view. So I'll move that over there. And then the other way that you can do it if you want to be a little bit more precise about things is if you already have objects in the view and you right click, um, if you say create here, uh, if for example I want to put a link in between these two floors, it actually will center the object right exactly where I had just right clicked. So now we can move that into place. And you can see that with links, um, and this is true of ramps and stairs and escalators as well, um, there are indicators on the object itself about the, the current state of the object. So uh, what we refer to as the goal lines on either side here, they've got, they're uh, gray because this actually isn't properly configured. This link isn't linking between two things. It's just over top of a single floor. Uh, if I move those over, uh, over so that each end is over a unique floor, then the, the object the, the goal lines turn green, which means that the object is in a valid position. Um, I'm just going to switch over to the scale function here. Um, all of these have hotkeys, which are indicated um, via the, uh, the tool tip, which comes up if you hover over it. So scale is can be grabbed that way. So we'll make that a little bit wider. And then um, for sort of the the simplest version of the scene that we could possibly have. Uh, what I will do is just create a couple of portals. So there's one there. And I've pressed Control D to duplicate it. And now I've got two portals on my on e two portals on my scene, one over each of the two floors and a link between the two floors. So this is the, the sort of well it's actually not actually the bare minimum you need. You could actually have a single room with two portals on it and that would be sufficient to describe a, an agent journey somewhere. Um, but this is a pretty simple scene and to put a very basic population in it, we'll just create a journey which goes from one portal to the other. So we go to events, click on journey, and um, you can see that there's a bunch of different information. When is this journey, when is the journey going to start? Uh, and the journey um, in this case is, um, what it's going to do is create a group of agents. So right now it's specifying 100 agents who are going to make this journey. And those agents are going to start appearing uh, right at the simulation start. And they're going to be introduced to the scene over a period of, say, two minutes. Um, we then need to specify an origin for the agents. So a simple click out in the scene um, or even in the list view. And then clicking the plus key just adds them to the, uh, to the particular um, origins or destinations list that you're trying to put them into. And that's it. That is a very simple mass motion scene. And if I go to the analysis tab and click on run simulation, up comes this dialog box. And um, it's almost ready to go, except that this indicator is showing red, which means that it does need, we do need to supply a path for the, uh, for the output of the simulation to live in. And I tend to put that in this directory, kind of a scratch directory for me. And we press run. We can see that this window comes up. 
Um, it gives us some feedback on uh, how many agents have been created, how many are currently in the scene, and uh, some overall statistics about the simulation. And now if we go back in here, we can see the agents are in the scene and moving from one portal to the other via the link that we've provided. Um, it's not a particularly big population, so everybody's moving through there quite nicely. Um, but if the link was narrower or the um, or the population was higher, which maybe we'll just try very quickly, uh, we'll say instead of 100 agents that we want 500 agents over that two minute period and then rerun it, um, we should start to see some congestion on that uh, on that link. A mm, little bit. Still not too bad. Um, just going back to the list view for a second, this menu up here uh, allows you to filter the, the types of objects that are going to be shown in the list view. Um, there is also a uh, search functionality as well. So if I want to search for floors, you can see that it starts bringing those up uh, automatically and it sort of turns green to indicate that it is having a successful search. Um, if I type in some nonsense string there, uh, you can see that it goes a little bit red, which indicates that there's nothing in the scene which matches the query that you're, uh, that you're running. Um, Question for you, Aaron, actually. <coughs> Uh, pretty straightforward yep. one. Spec, actually, which I think is worthwhile mentioning. What spec would you recommend to be running these basic types of simulation? Um, I, the thing that we so there's um, the, the first thing is that uh, mass motion only runs on 64-bit operating systems, which are pretty common these days. So that's probably not going to be an issue. Um, the other thing which is important is um, is that your graphics card supports. Um, the correct level of OpenGL, which I believe is 2.1. It needs to be at least 2.1. Um, I think OpenGL is up to 4.4. So um, there's, you know, it, most most computers will be able to do, uh, any computer that's bought in the last two years probably will be able to run mass motion at a certain level. Um, obviously, as the simulations get bigger and the agent populations uh, also get bigger, um, you know, having a a multi-core computer with eight or even 16 cores um, and a fair bit of RAM is quite useful. Um, certainly, I've seen mass motion simulations where the memory footprint can get up, um, you know, to 10 or 12 gigabytes. Um, so it's uh, it depends a bit on the scale of the modeling you're doing. But I would say anything from laptop to desktop built over the last two years will be sufficient for, you know, models of 10 or 20,000 people probably uh, without without sweating too much. Well, thank you. Okay. Now oh, that's great. Um, so we've uh, we've taken a look at um, at a simple example geometrically, um, just to talk a little bit about uh, some of the more advanced modeling tools that exist in Math Motion now. Um, if, for example, we want to create a um, another level to this to this simulation, um, I've just duplicated one of my existing floors and, and raised it up a bit, um, and I will also create a, um, a stair object and. I'm just going to move that over to the side. Now, uh, the stair obviously is not quite the right height, um, and that could be that either I've made this this floor a bit too high, so I can move that back down. But maybe also um, my stair isn't quite the right size either. So, um, in addition to being able to move things around at the object level, there's also the ability to do uh, sub-object modeling. So vertex, edge, or polygon face mode, um, you can grab hold of these things as well. So if I go to vertex mode, we can see that these blue dots show up that represent the vertices. Um, if I turn on my, my translate tool, I can now move that up and 
into the correct position. And I can see that the uh, the end of the stair has gone uh, has gone green, which indicates that it's it's valid. Now it's valid, but it's a little weird because if we put um, if we put a portal up here, and if we go back to our uh, our journey, and we add that portal to our origins, and then run it, what we'll see is that the um, well, this will probably run just fine. We'll see some kind of weird behavior at the top of the stairs because the agents can sort of approach the top of the stairs from from whatever direction they want to which does look a little bit weird and in some cases I don't know whether it's going to happen here particularly but you may even see uh, agents that are coming from the right hand side start to interfere with uh, the agents which should be loading from the left hand side um, which is obviously not correct and on top of that it looks a little funny that they're actually descending right through the stairs you can also see down here at the bottom that they actually fall off the stairs a little bit early. Um, part of what happens with the agents is they get to the, the bottom of, of stairs and escalators and that sort of thing is they start sort of searching for the, the next floor that they're going to get onto. Um, and if they find it a floor, uh, an available floor space under the stair, they, they may get off a little bit early as they're doing here. So neither of those things are appropriate. Um, and there's a couple of ways that we can correct that. Uh, the first, is to just cut a hole in the floor, which probably makes a lot of sense here because they look weird um, moving through the floor. So this is an instance where I am going to go in and do things at the top view just because it provides a slightly better look at things. So there is the ability to, um, to use a knife tool to cut the, the geometry up. And I'll just quickly do that here. And here. And so now we've got this uh, very fractured floor, but critically we've got this, um, we've, we've isolated some polygons over here on this edge that we can now get rid of quite easily. So now if I go to face select, I can just grab hold of those and delete them, and we've got, uh, got a nice opening for our stair there. Hopefully nobody's going to bump their heads on that. Um, and there is also a simplified tool as well, so you can go in here and, and clean up the mess that, that that is that geometry. So now it's back to a nice, simple, clean bit of geometry. And then down here under this stair, we could do one of two things. Actually, we could um, we cut out another hole, and that would certainly work. If we cut out a hole sort of in this area, um, the agents would no longer see a valid floor, and they would continue their journey all the way. Uh, the other thing that you can do in these situations is you can actually just put a barrier underneath that, that bit of the stair as well. And <clears throat> I'm just going to do a bit of quick scaling and manipulating to, uh, to get this thing roughly in the shape that we want it to be. So there it is. And then... What I'll do is just get down there. And so now because there's a barrier underneath that stair, they're not going they're not going to see it as a valid place for them to be standing either. So now if we rerun this, we should see that the uh, the agents do a much better job of approaching, um, moving down the stair and then exiting the stair appropriately at the end at the end of their trip on it. And so now there's a very clear indication to the agents how they should be approaching the stair. They're obviously moving through it without um, contacting it and exiting it, the stair completely at the other end. Um, well, we're taking a look at this. I'll just talk about a couple of other things which can be useful tools when uh, when dealing with, especially with multi-floor environments. Um, obviously, you can't see the agents underneath this floor. Uh, there's a couple ways that you might deal with that. One is that if you um, if you double click on it or right click on the object, you will bring up the properties for the object. 
Um, all objects, all 3D objects have a color property. You can open that up and you can set the, the alpha value on the object to something other than 255 and now you can actually see through the object a bit. So that's one way of dealing with it. Now we can see the, the flows both up and down. Uh, the other thing that you can do is um, make sure that this setting is on, hide agents on hidden floors. And then if I select this object and hide it, now all the objects that are on that floor are just not drawn in the uh, in the view. It does look a little weird that this portal is still showing up, so perhaps we hide that as well. Um, but that's just a, a couple of ways that you can deal with, um, with visibility uh, across multiple floors. So there we go. Um, Right. Uh, I'm going to switch over to a different model, so if there are any questions, now's a, now's a good break to, uh, to do so. I was just thinking the same thing. <coughs> so a couple have come through. So uh, can you color code the density flux or jitter of the crowd? Yes, absolutely. Um, and actually, since we've got some, some variable density here, we'll, we'll, before I move over, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So. There's I'm going to answer a question, sorry, as well, quickly. A few people have asked about if this uh, session's been recorded. I've hit record, so the answer is yes, and I'll share it with you probably in the next couple of days. Okay, great. So when it comes to exploring the density of the crowds, uh, there's a few things that we can look at. I mean, the first thing to note is that the color of the agents um, is by default set according to the color of the journey that was used or the color that was set for the, um, the event that created them. Uh, since we have orange here, um, we've got orange agents. Now, that can be changed quite easily by uh, going in to the, uh, the simulation run that you're looking at. It is possible to have multiple simulation runs in your, uh, in your view here. We only have the one right now. But if I double click on this, um, the way to set the color of the agents is is actually not through this. This is the, the color of the, um, the, the, the simulation run pointer, effectively. Um, right now, what it's doing, you go down here to the way the agents are displayed, and you can see that there's a bunch of options. Uh, there's a custom one, so you can set you know, whatever color you would like, blue color or something. Um, but the other thing that's in there is uh, a number of different uh, density metrics. So the one that people are usually most interested in looking at is the, um, the Fruin densities. Uh, and it just automatically color codes uh, A through F, um, A being dark blue and F being red. And what you'll see is that that changes dynamically as the agents move around. Um, so as they join this queue, they go to F. But you know, in most other places, they're, they're sort of uh, C or better. Um, what the, the little auto in brackets here means that they are getting um, the walkway level of service up here on the floor and on their approach to the stair, but once they get on the stair itself, it'll actually be using the stairway level of service. Um, there is also uh, the option of doing things like through and queuing, uh, which is a much more permissive standard, so the, um, generally speaking, the, the colors will be, uh, will be more in the blue spectrum. Uh, there's even something in there for um, the IATA weight circulate standard as well, if you're taking a look at uh, sort of you know, airport hold rooms or that kind of thing. Um, now, in addition to being able to um, color, see, the, see the density of the agents on the fly, um, there is also the ability uh, to get the properties for individual agents as well. So you can right click on an agent and observe what's going on with them. As it plays back, you can see that it's actually telling you exactly what the density is. Um, so persons per square meter, um, and what, what standard is currently being applied to them. Um, and it tells you things like their speed and what their status is and you know, what their journey is, um, all that stuff. Um, I guess maybe 
maybe before we move on, we'll take a quick look at some of the analysis stuff as well. Um, often what you're interested in is not what the current density is, but actually what the uh, average density of the, uh, of the agents is. And so for that, what you do is you go to the analysis tab, um, and perhaps what you want to do is create a, um, <clears throat> an average density map for the, uh, for the, the period of the simulation that you're interested in. So just, I'm just going to take a quick look here because we only have agents in this model for you know, five minutes or so. So, sorry, two or three minutes, I guess. So what I will do is say, instead of all available time, I'm going to say for a very specific interval of from uh, right at the beginning of the simulation to, say, five minutes in, um, I want to see what the average density is for all of these spaces. And uh, sampling period of one second. We'll start with the Fruin, um, the Fruin Auto, and we evaluate it. And so that's the uh, that's the result. Uh, we can see that most places in the simulation are actually doing quite well, um, but with all that queuing that happens at the top of the stairs, there's obviously um, something going on there which we might want to consider. And then. Um, a couple of things you can you can look at it as a gradient rather than as a um, as a stark contour map, and um, you can uh, you can easily add or remove things. Uh, you just show and hide controls up here as well. So um, if we were to switch it over to the weight circulate standard, um, it's already calculated all the results. So basically, all this is doing is indicating which um, which colors are going to be applied to it. There is also the ability to set a custom standard as well. So if I wanted to have um, you know, something beyond F or, you know, or, uh, or to set some, or if there is some standard that you're using for which we don't have defaults, it is possible to set up the, uh, um, the particular set of uh, color contours that you're interested in. Not a question for you, Aaron, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this one's more about the, the agent profile, I believe. The question is, can you also have agents with different heights, so BMI, so, and I suppose that relates to uh, in people who are in, you know, disabled people, or PRMs, however you want to refer to people with different types of movement or speed. So how would you do that? Yep. So the way that you do that is uh, under the Events tab, right beside the, the, the Journey Circulate and Vehicle and Evacuate, events which create agents, there's also this profile um, option. Uh, the default profile is, uh, is effectively the Fruin commuter profile, so a person with a radius of a quarter meter, um, speeds that range from uh, just over half a meter per second all the way up to two meters per second uh, with a standard deviation uh, dis that distributes the values within that range. Uh, they have a directional bias. Um, there is the option to choose uh, a different geometrical um, representation for them. Um, and then you can also adjust the, um, the ranges with, within which uh, individuals will be assigned coefficients for how much they care about horizontal and vertical distances, uh, queuing costs, and, and processing costs. So, um, the question is really, you, to have different people with different uh, sizes, what you would do is create a number of different profiles which have uh, different radii for their, for their body. So you could have people that were much bigger. Um, you know, those people were represented. Um, you know, someone who had um, that luggage or maybe was uh, pushing a stroller or something like that. And there, that's the way of representing it. It's probably worth mentioning that, um, as far as you know, although although you can do it, we wouldn't recommend going much beyond, um, say, a, a radius of about 0.75 meters or so. Um, once the agents get really big, or when there's a really diverse range, and, and there are some extreme sizes in there, um, it does start to do funny things to the crowd characteristics overall. Um, you're welcome to try it, but uh, it, it, you may start to find that it uh, starts to produce sort of nonsensical results. Thanks, Aaron.
one other one. Oh, quite a few. We can kind of answer yep. this in the next one, but this is talking about applying different weights to different portals and points of egress or entrances and exits. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I suppose we can cover that in your next model. Yeah, let's um, let's take a look at this model. I think it's going to have enough portals in it that we can talk about that. I might even have. This looks interesting. Yeah, let's see. How does this work? So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is, the way that this model is set up is, I mean, it's, it's, it's very notional and representational, but um, what this could represent, for example, is, is, a, is a small, um, you know, sort of retail uh, center or something where you've got Perhaps this represents the, where people are coming from, from the parking lot. Uh, there's a sort of foyer space. There's upstairs to, a, to some sort of location, and then maybe three stores around here in the back. Um, and the way that this has been developed is using the circulate event. And so what you do is it, this is basically saying people are going to come from the parking. They're going to go. They're going to return to the parking, or the streets, or whatever this is in this case. And then when it comes to their circulation. Um, what they're going to do is um, circulate for somewhere between 300 and 600 seconds, um, and they are going to also be limited by um, a total circulate count of one to three, or between one and three locations visited. Um, and then they're going to, when they get to a location, wait for somewhere between 30 and 150 seconds, and they're going to spread out while they're doing that. Now. What we said is that all of these portals, store one, two, three, and four, are the, the various locations that might circulate to. Um, and there's a couple of different options here about how you can set up the uh, the distribution of trips between those two things, those four things. Um, and so, if you want to set a custom value, so for example, um, if I know that I want lots of people going up here because this is the anchor store or something like that. Um, what I can do is say, um, I'll set a weight of one for all of them except this one, for which I will set a weight of three. And then I can uh, just click this button to normalize it. And there we go. So these are the percentages by which people are going to go to to these stores and their, and their circulation behavior. Um, and so if we go do the analysis, we run the simulation. Um, oh. Create a new one. There we go. So what we should be seeing now is um, a bunch of agents coming in. And um, half of them basically going up here to um, to this sort of anchor store location, and smaller numbers of them circulating to the the, the smaller what we're calling retail locations over here at the back end of the store. Um, let me just advance that a little bit so we can sort of see this playing out. And then eventually, what will happen is the the agents will start to uh, as they complete their circulation see that they're sort of moving around between the stores. You'll start to see some of them uh, exiting the facility as well. So this is, by the time the agents start exiting, because they're all um, on the same circulate pattern, more or less, with, with, you know, with a few different distribution characteristics, um, this is probably something like the peak load of the, uh, the facility right here. Interesting question as well, while this is one in area. Um, I suppose, uh, how would you then present, the best mm -hmm. way to present this to your client, but the, the question specifically is, can you add metadata to the agents so that you can demonstrate things like increased sales, code compliance, based on the, the outcome of the simulation, things like live loads, so, um, football analysis, I suppose, uh, football, how do you show the football uh, in each potential retail store? Right. So if you wanted to show, I mean, well, there's a few different ways of doing that. I mean, if you just want to do it at a very high level, um, what you might do 
is uh, create a um, uh, da, 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 where is it going here? A no, it's right at the top. That's why I can't see it. Um, an agent count map. So uh, we'll just we'll evaluate this and see what it looks like. But we basically are just going to say, right, for the entire simulation, um, just color the the floor areas based on the amount of time there was actually somebody there. Um, oh, I can add those to the uh, to the list of things that I want evaluated. And I also need to choose, I think that was the one that we're working with. No, no, it's not. Hang on. I should have cleaned this model up before I used it as a demonstrator. <laughs> Let's just delete those ones that are old and no good. All right, so default run two is the one that uh, that we want to use. So there it is. So there we go. Um, you know, if we don't like the white base color, we can switch that to something else. Um, but there we have it. And we can also um, just hide our population as well. So now we have a map which basically shows the intensity of activity throughout the simulation uh, for the entire space. Uh, another one. Now, if you, sorry. Yeah, and, I, sorry, and just as to that question about adding metadata to, um, to the agents, it is possible to add metadata to the agents and use those as um, uh, handles on which you would do more in-depth queries about the agent activity. Um, but the ability to add metadata to an agent is something which only exists in the um, in the advanced mass motion package, not the mass motion flow package. Another quite I can see that you've got uh, a ramp there, is it, in, as part of this particular model. One of the questions that has just come come in is can can what is it can you do escalators with one directional traffic well it will escalate this would only be one way flow if you like but things like stairs and ramps the directional flow can be changed from one way to another or two way flow so I don't know if you want to yeah. show that yeah so I mean so here's a here's an escalator object um, Rotate that and uh, scale it down a bit. I'm probably going to need to change my view to get this right. Um, but yes, certainly uh, the, um, the circulation element, any circulation element, whether it's a link or a stair or a ramp, what have you, um, can be made uh, one way only. And so let's hide the agents here. Um, and escalators, uh, when you create them, uh, they're one way by default, which, uh, which seems sensible enough. Um, but the way you manage that is to go into um, the properties of a link object and um, what you can see here is the very first object is, uh, if you look carefully at any um, any link object, you'll see that one goal line has uh, sort of ball shapes at the end, and the other one has boxes at the end of it. And so you just set the direction that way. So are they going from um, ball to box, box to ball? Uh, and interestingly, uh, if I open this one, you'll see that for stairway, for stairs, and for ramps, you actually uh, in links as well, you get the option of two way as well. There is no two way option for escalators. Yeah. So now we've sort of got a, um, a stair escalator pair, if you will. Um, and if we rerun the simulation now, oh, it's not quite lined up properly. Yeah, here. there we go. A little bit close to the edge there. All right. So now if we run this simulation. Um, 
we'll see that agents are agents that are going up to that uh, to that uh, anchor store are now probably going to be more likely to choose the the escalator, both because um, the agents will perceive escalators as more efficient routes generally, but also because um, uh, there's also a sort of opposing flow cost on um, on links or on uh, yeah, on links and links. In this case, I'm using it in a general way to also include stairs, ramps, and escalators. Um, so uh, when agents perceive that they're going against the flow, um, and if there is an option which has um, in which the flow is more congruent with their direction of travel, they will elect to choose the one which has the more congruent flow direction. And what we need to do is, well, First of all, let's hide the map and just see what what change that's made to our to our simulation results. And there, as expected, we've got agents that are using the escalator uh, to go up rather than using the stair. Um, obviously, agents that are coming down from that location are going to have to use the stair. Eventually, we should have some use there. We've got them doing that now, um, and then we can rerun our map and and uh, and understand what's what, if any, changes have been made as a result of introducing that um, that up escalator? While you're updating that map, there is a couple of questions come in about importing geometry. So, uh, if your uh, people here have mentioned SketchUp, Rhino, and Revit, so what you can do, we like to think of mass motion flow and mass motion. Being BIM compliant tools, if you like. So, if you've got a Revit model, everything you've seen here, Aaron's modeled up directly within mass motion. So, that's an option. But you've, if you already have geometry, then you can import that. So, it's from SketchUp or Rhino that can come in via FBX, Aaron. Is that the best, best way in? Yeah. Um, so, if you want to import geometry, um, the options you have are .3DS, uh, EA, Collada, DXF, FBX. IFC or OBJ. Uh, so if you have a Revit model, then we that, that would come in via IFC, and that would actually do all the classic classification for you. So mass motion would understand if a, a slab is a floor, a door is a link, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you're just importing geometry, then it would be a case of going through those objects and classifying them using mass motion. So in summary, if you've already created that geometry, why do that again? We can just import that and use it within mass motion. Yeah, and I'll actually I'll demonstrate the IFC import process in uh, in just a moment. One of the okay. one of the things I do want to I, I think we're getting close to the end of our hour here, so I just want to quickly touch on a couple of other things. Um, in addition to being able to do maps of various sorts, it's also possible to do um, you know, graphs. Um, I'll just do a quick population count graph here. Um, so. <clears throat> Add a group, and maybe what we'll do is just add. Um, we'll add all the floors, say, to the. Actually, no, not, not the parking lot, though. So we don't care about people outside our building. So there's the. Um, we've added a number of uh, number of um, areas within the model uh, to this thing that we're going to graph. Uh, for population, there's the option to do just a count for all the areas combined or to do a count per member. And then what you can do is generate your graph. And now it's showing you, um, color-coded here, uh, what, the, um, what the populations are for each of those over time. Um, interesting to note that, and you can also see there's that dashed line there which allows you to sort of move your time to examine any particular thing that you see. Um, there are a few different ways of presenting it as well so that you can, for example, say uh, instead of curves, I actually want um, stacked areas. So now the <clears throat> the difference there is that the um, each one of these is, is plotted from zero, um, but you stack them, when you stack the areas, you actually get a sort of cumulative value as well. So this model peaks out at about 250 people uh, right at around this timeline, this time. Um, and you can also do, um, you can do it by bar as well. So there's a few different ways of presenting it. Um, you can export these as CSVs if you want to do further work on it in, uh, in Excel, or you can export the image 
and you have the option of um, PNG as a raster format and both um, scalable vector graphics and PDF as, uh, as vector format outputs. So they can be put more or less directly into reports. Um, so there's also the ability to show a legend on the graph as well. So um, everything goes straight in. I haven't named these particularly well, but certainly you could you could change that. Worth noting that um, when you move to a bar graph, it actually shows it by block of time, um, as uh, <clears throat> as indicated in the bin size here. Um, one other important thing is um, the ability to create agent filters. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this, but this is this is where the real power of the the analysis system lies, is in being able to go in and really target specific groups of of the agents. So if we want to, for example, say we want agents who are ever um, visiting this chain store in mezzanine two, um, we can create that filter. And then if we go to the to our simulation run, for example, we can say, right, I want the base color of the agents to be the database, that's fine. But then I would like their I would like to color um, the I'll just reuse that filter that I created. Redo it. And it looks like everybody in the model right now has visited that location, which is interesting. There's not there's a few. So you can see as you move through it that just because of the way we've set it up with um, the, the chain store having that really large proportion of people who are likely to circulate to it. It turns out that most people in the model actually are going to end up visiting it. Uh, but you see the occasional orange one, which um, which isn't there. And you can then use that filter to do um, tabular queries as well, um, so that you can, uh, and also with the map, you can actually use the filter to only apply these these things to um, to the specific subgroups that you're interested in as well. Could I ask, um, ask for one more map, which I think is always interesting, the vision map, the vision time map. I know we can, I don't think we have time to show the IFC import, but I've just noticed there's actually a, a short video you've created, which I can share with people anyway. So I mean, we need to yep. cover that. But yeah, if we show this, then I think we can look at wrapping up in the next couple of minutes. OK. Um, yeah, so the, vi the vision map is, uh, relatively straightforward. It, it allows you to just choose things and it, what it will do is color um, the surfaces of this based on which areas of it are experienced or are being looked at by agents over various lengths of time. Um, it is worth pointing out that um, this model, uh, this query can be fairly expensive to run computationally because it is um, it is doing pretty in pretty detailed 3D calculations of the entire scene. Um, it's a pretty interesting structure you've got there as well. Is that just some uh, been having a play around with? Oh, you know, editing. All high end <laughs> yeah, that was me playing with the editing controls, and and all you know, decent malls need some weird piece of sculpture in them somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah. So as you can see, even for this model, which is relatively simple, um, although it does run for a bit of time, um, there's quite a lot of of agent data and for it to look through to figure out exactly who's been looking where and at what. Um, one of the things which is interesting about this solution as well, though, is that, and that this isn't going to show it up particularly well, but um, the if there were other barrier objects around our sculpture, um, those barriers effectu effectively cast shadows as well. So the um, so you really do get a, a true um, understanding of. Yeah. There. So now we can look here in here, and we can see these are the hot spots of how of which areas of this people are seeing, and you can see that it's sort of right at the eye levels of the agents. Um, and I think we're probably what we're doing here is we're seeing a bit of people coming up the stairs and stuff, being able to uh, to see down around here as well. That's interesting. Yeah. All right, Eric. Well, um, I know we can see a few people have dropped off, so I think we're we're hitting the, the time allocation we'd allowed for. So thanks for that. I'll ask if anyone's got any additional questions, then please put them into the chat box now. Uh, what I'll do is, while we're waiting for those questions, is switch up my screen. 
see what details, but hopefully this session was useful. We're very excited about mass motion flow. I think it's a great tool. Erin and the team have done, uh, I think, a great job in providing a tool that lots of you have asked for, so sort of a cut-down version of mass motion at, uh, at a lower cost as well. So, yeah, all the feedback you've got is going to be very useful for us. If you do have any questions, then please just get in touch. The open beta, I think, it expires on the 29th of this month, Erin. Did we manage to confirm a date? Uh, I think the beta, the beta is officially closing on the 31st of January. Um, and uh, that right at that time, um, or right around that time anyway, we will be making available the, um, the final version of the software. Um, yeah, which will. To, uh, to have a play with and, and hopefully acquire. Exactly. Perfect. Well, there you go. That looks pretty interesting. What have you got there? What have you done? Uh, so this is just demonstrating that it is now possible to put textured geometry in mass motion as well. Um, so if you want to take the effort to, uh, you know, to, to bring in your textured models from whatever viz package you're using, it is possible to get them in there as reference geometry and sort of have a slightly higher impact uh, presentation. Um, and going along with that is the ability to do uh, you know, direct capture of movies and images um, from within mass motion. Um, yeah, and if there's anybody still on the line, I don't, I'm not looking at the list, Reese, but um, yep. if people are still there, what I can just quickly do, because it was mentioned earlier, is uh, I'll show what the IFC import looks like, and then I think that'll be it for me. Yeah, that's fine. So this is just a, a very simple um, airport model that was, uh, you know, like a, maybe a small regional airport that was built up using Revit and um, one of the things which is which is worth noting is that we have this sort of every time you bring in a import a set of geometry it, there are controls about um, the placement of that object so if for example you need to correct for unit scaling or you've got a, a strange offset point in, in how your model is positioned you can correct for all of that here um, and you can you can save the values for later so that subsequent imports can be uh, can bring the geometry in in the same way and, and have it all maintain the same relative position. Um, so here we've got all of our geometry that's come in. You can see that it has recognized the incoming types um, based on their IFC topologies. And then um, IFC geometry, when it comes in, is, um, is interesting because the in addition to being able to um, use any, you can do this with any geometry. You can say, right, I want to use this geometry to create, you know, a barrier or a floor or what have you. With IFC geometry, because of its um, uh, the metadata that comes in with it, it it uh, is able to to hint to mass motion what ought to be done with it. So I can say auto, and it turns that into a wall. And more importantly, I can select all the geometry and uh, and say that I want it to be auto converted, and mass motion is going to do its best job to make um, to make good guesses about what is uh, what each of these bits of geometry is. It hasn't figured out what to do with these baggage carousels because that's not an obvious thing to it. Um, but for those that you can just say, right, I know I want those to be barriers. Um, having looked at this model a bit, um, I I know that these escalators were created as slabs, so there, that's kind of a funny one for it as well. And it's easy enough to go in and select all the escalator bits and create uh, create escalators out of those. And then I think at that point we've sort of done something with everything that we're interested in doing something with, and we'll just hide the rest of the geometry. And you can see that we've we've already gotten our stairs. We, we corrected for these escalators. All the doorways have been turned into links between the various areas of the building. And it's pretty much ready to go in terms of having portals put down and starting to have agents um, scheduled within it. Mm -hmm. I think the point to make that was pretty straightforward. There was a bit of cleanup that, that was required, as I say, you know, just as you import any type yeah. of information. But that's come in quite nicely, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I think it's, and I think the experience that we've had over the last couple of years is that um, Revit models think are better organized than they ever used to be. So the mm -hmm. the percentage of the geometry that needs to be cleaned up seems to be falling over time, which is great. Um, so yeah, it's not, you know, I don't think it's unusual to expect 
to get you know somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of your model coming in and and being classified correctly when you when you auto convert it. Perfect. All right, now I'm just going to wrap up here. I'll ping my details on the screen. Now you should you get a follow up email saying thank you for coming along to the webinar. So thank you for coming. Uh, my details are on the screen here as well. Errands are the same, just with Aaron.morrow. And yeah, if you've got any questions, then please let us know. We'd be keen to get your feedback. I can see a couple of people have commented to say that this session was useful, which is great. Anything else, then please do just drop us an email, and uh, you will look forward to speaking to you after the open beta has been closed and the official, well, the official app software is available for you to download. So thanks again, and we hope you continue to use mass motion flow. And thank you, Aaron, as well, for setting the side uh, time to run this session. Great. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a good day.